Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney from Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to this week's Focus Israel Report. In this week's report, we're going to be sharing with you regarding Hanak Young, an Orthodox Jew from the United States who now lives in Israel, gave a message at the recent Alliance of Redeemed Israel conference where he embraced Ephraim as his brother and welcomed him to come home to the land of Israel. We will now share with you that message. How many Orthodox Jews do you know would be willing to come up here and speak to you today on what he's going to speak to you about? But he made it happen anyway because he knew he had to be here to share this message with you. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, my friend and my brother, Hanok Young. Thank you. This is very, very emotional for me. And before I say anything else, I want to give a special thanks to Batya and Angus for having the courage and the vision to invite me here. You know, it's very nice. I, you know, it's been almost 20 years since I began meeting people who said, you know, I think I'm part of Israel. And you hear about unity all the time. Judah and Ephraim, Judah and Ephraim. How many people actually take the step towards making that happen? So to Batya and Angus, thank you. I love you. Thank you for all you do. Okay, you're probably wondering exactly who I am and kind of why I'm here. We'll, we'll get to that. What's more important, however, is who you are and why you are here. Now, I'm no genius, but I know who you are. You're my brothers and sisters. We collectively are from the B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. One people split into two nations, and then more than three quarters of us torn apart by the Assyrian exile, scattered throughout the world, forced as part of the punishment, this is really emotional, to forget their identity. Now, I don't want anyone here to start feeling bad about having missed this family reunion of all times. It hasn't happened yet. It's beginning to happen now. And guess what? You're all invited. Ken mentioned theology. I need to make something very clear to everyone, please. I acknowledge you. I accept you as my brothers and sisters without condition. No caveats, no asterisks, no but, no comma, no however, no semicolon. That's without theological debate, without question, without the theological urinating contest that goes on all the time. Oh, and by the way, not just between us, between Ephraim and Ephraim. And it's the most painful thing. As someone who tries to meet and network with my brothers and sisters, you groups split apart like amoeba every other week. And self-appointed leaders, not people who've been doing this for years, who are pioneers. No, these are people who've studied the King James translation for, wow, it's probably about two and a half months. And now they're a leader. Now you all, y'all, I get to say y'all, by the way, because, now you could probably hear that this is an accent born and bred in the Bronx, New York, but in part of the divine irony, Ephraim comes from the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah comes from the southern kingdom. Boys and girls, I'm a southerner. I get to say y'all all I want. Now, everyone wants to know well, what happens when we join together? Who's going to theologically give one way or the other? Well, you know what's really funny? Yechezkel, Ezekiel 37. God himself says that he's going to take the sticks. He's going to put them together. And you know what? He's going to solve whatever issues remain between us. What does that mean in a practical sense? Do you know what? If he tells me, Hanoch, you should have been doing a lot more of this or a lot less of that, I'm ready to deal with it. And I hope you'll join me in that openness. Now, why is it that I think the tribes will return? I mean, why? Well, we don't have time to go through chapter and verse, and you all know them by now, but guess what? There's 160 plus references throughout the Tanakh, throughout the Hebrew Bible, that make references to Judah and Ephraim, or Judah and Israel, or Judah and Joseph, or Judah and Samaria, same thing. Now, the conventional interpretation until recently is, well, we're talking about the Jewish people. Right. Okay, so the Tanakh is saying that the Jewish people and the Jewish people will go, 
No, it makes no sense. This is the single most prevalent theme throughout the Tanakh, throughout the entire Hebrew Bible. So how do we begin to reunite if it's going to be done by God? First of all, we have to draw closer to God. You need to draw closer to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. You need to come closer to your Jewish brothers and sisters. You need to draw closer to each other, closer to Ephraim. Enough with the backbiting, enough with the stabbing. You need to go to gatherings like this one. Reunification comes through respect, mutual respect. Not trying to change or dictate anything to anyone else. And also realizing that after 2,700 years, our one people have become two separate people, walking on two separate paths towards the same goal. And guess what? As we get closer, the paths, the space between us narrows. Watch, it will happen. Because he wants it to happen. That's the only reason. About 20 years ago, as I told you, I started encountering people. Again, they described themselves at the time as lost tribers, whatever. Like they had this love of Torah. They had a love of Israel. They had a love of the Jewish people. They didn't feel comfortable in church. I didn't know what to do with them. They didn't know what to do with themselves. And then I did something very clever. I went back and read the Tanakh again and again and again. And somehow I saw things that I didn't really internalize. I mean, I internalized them, yes. There's Ephraim and, you know, until the age of exploration was over a few centuries ago, it was believed that Ephraim was in some distant land behind the mountains, behind the river Sambathion, maybe in Australia. Who knew they were hiding in plain sight in the church somewhere? Divine irony yet again. I wanted to go to Israel from the time I became an adult and everything seemed to go wrong for me. I would lose a job. One of my parents got sick. Something was constantly going wrong. And I had to wander in the desert for decades. I would cry myself to sleep at night, pleading, why, why can't I go? And then a window of opportunity opened up for me four years ago. And I made Aliyah, La'alot, to ascend. And I'm an Israeli with a Bronx accent. But I was kept in the wilderness to be refined, to learn about Ephraim, to meet Ephraim, to travel with Ephraim. I now have the bracha, the blessing, to be a tour guide in Israel. It is so cool. I mean, like someone asked me, like, that's not what you know, you had all these other careers in America. Why did you go to Israel to be a tour guide? I said, well, I went to Israel and I'm becoming a tour guide because who else is going to be prepared to show Ephraim their homeland once again? I live in the city of Modi'in. Modi'in is Israel's first planned city. Israel's newest city, but the name may sound familiar, Modi'in. That was the ancient home of the Maccabees. The Maccabees who defeated the Greeks, restored the temple, and of course, brought us the holiday of Hanukkah. My purpose here though, wasn't just to run around and hug all of you, and I wish I could. If you're not already friends with me on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, let's join up, email me. I didn't come here though, simply for the hugs. I came here, because I'm looking to recruit. No, I'm not starting an organization. We have too many organizations. But I am looking to recruit revolutionaries for the restoration. <laughs> Nothing less. Nothing less. Now, I understand the term revolutionary. I grew up in New York City in the 70s. Every ethnic, racial, and religious group had its militant activist side, and even us crazy Jews had it too. By the time I was 20 years old, I had already been arrested on three different continents. But guess what? For this revolution, no violence required. You don't have to do what us crazy, you know, when you're between 18 and 20 years old, you're immortal. So instead of doing the things that other 18 to 20 year olds did, we were committed to try to defend the Jewish people anywhere in the world. I was one of seven who went and staged the sit-in in Moscow, in the Soviet Union. There was a Jewish prisoner of conscience, Dr. Mikhail Stern, who was serving seven years of hard labor in Siberia. So we figured the seven of us are young and healthy, we could serve out his sentence. Let him go free. Now, myself and five of the other six we live in Israel. We see each other from time to time, bump into each other in Jerusalem, buying vegetables in the shuk, in the market, see each other at weddings. And I have to tell you, now we look back on it and say, 
What if they would have said yes? What were we thinking? But you know what? It's that spirit that I'm after. It's that commitment that I'm after. We don't have to stage sit-ins. But this is a different revolution, guys. This is a revolution of the spirit, a revolution of the heart. It's a revolution to commit yourselves to staying committed, not to leave from the high of a conference like this and to go back to business as usual until next year's conference. That's unacceptable. If we want this to happen, we have to show by our actions. You know, they say, pray as if prayer is the only thing that will matter, but act as if our actions and our actions alone will make the difference. So what kind of actions? Well, what are you doing to fight the boycott, divestment, and sanctions that the world, that the Anglican Church, the Church of Scotland, and liberal Protestant denominations here in America are trying to cripple Israel's economy by boycotting Israeli products, by boycotting Israeli professors. Well, you know what? Right here in the marketplace, right next door, you've got Sabra Style. Sabra has created the opportunity to sell and expose everyone to Israel's products. Make sure to speak to her later. See if you can help her spread that message. I'm going to close with two quick stories, and they're both from the Torah, our Torah, which we share. The first one is that wonderful story. The children of Israel have experienced miracles. The Exodus, they're going out. They're walking through the desert. They're going to the Red Sea. Actually, it's called the Reed Sea, but we'll do the tour guide thing another time. And all of a sudden, one person turns around and sees the clouds of dust. Pharaoh's chariots are coming. So, of course, we, and God loves us, but we are such an ungrateful people. Having witnessed miracles, the generation of the Exodus still runs to Moshe, to Moses. Moses, do something, do something. He begins doing what Ken said. He starts praying. He's praying. What's the Lord's response? In Hebrew, it's three words. I'll translate it into English. Ma titzake lai. Why are you crying to me? What God was saying is, I've already told you what to do. You know what to do. Do it. So don't go home after this wonderful weekend and cry to anybody. You know what to do. You know what to do. And the last part, and this for me is like the most emotional part of the whole Torah. It's the story of Yosef. Joseph. And we all know, and he's, you know, he's playing his games, he's teasing his brothers, he's... And then he reaches a point where the pent-up emotions are so... He can't control himself. And he sends the Egyptians out of the room. With a primal scream, he yells out, Ani Yosef! I am Joseph. I can't even imagine the reaction of his brothers. Probably something like this. This is the guy we sold into slavery. Yeah. Mm. This is the guy we told our beloved elderly father had died. Yeah. Mm. Mm. The next verse, Yosef repeats himself. Ani Yosef Achichem. I'm Joseph, your brother. He cries out. Cries out. Well, you know what? I've heard your cries. I felt your anguish. I felt your pain, your loneliness, your isolation. You're stumbling out of the darkness, saying, this is not where I belong. I know you're Joseph. And that's why I've come back for you. And that's why, with God's help, I'll continue to come back for you. May this coming year be a year filled with brachot, with blessings for us all. May it bring us closer to unity. May we actually learn to actualize the love we speak in our actions. I love you all. I miss you. Come home. Come home. Please. Please stay in touch. I love you all. Well, that's going to conclude this week's report. Until we do it again, Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen.